An Elder Scrolls Legends Battlespire has always occupied a strange dusty corner of the Elder Scrolls catalogue, both in recognition and in established canon. Once a fairly impressive technological accomplishment for its time, in the decades after it has since been relegated to a back of the shelf item. One that is not picked out and examined thoroughly so often as it is set upon by wandering, curious glances. You can ogle at it, point at it, and say, hmm, that's odd, I wonder what that's all about. But you'll never really know the full story unless you try the thing yourself. Way back in 1997, Battlespire was the first spin-off game Bethesda ever made for their long-lived and beloved Elder Scrolls franchise, and it's no wonder the series has the prestige that it's so rightly earned. Ever since the very first game, Arena, the series has always took pride in providing the most ambitious game worlds with the highest degree of player agency. When people say that Daggerfall is the best game in the series, they aren't reminiscing about its 5 hour dungeon crawls and great in combat encounters. They remember the scope, the ambition, and how it felt to be surrounded by all that. All the elements that truly separate the Elder Scrolls from its competitors, not just as a marketable IP, but as an idea of what a role-playing game can be. So question, what would the Elder Scrolls look like if it didn't try to separate itself from its peers? If it took all that ambition and threw it out the window? What if the Elder Scrolls was just a series of extensive dungeon crawls with combat that feels like grinding two rocks against each other? Well, you get an Elder Scrolls Legends Battlespire. As you trudge through the dank crypts, defiled tombs, and fluorescent corridors of this antiquated adventuring sim, many questions will claw their way into the forefront of your boggled little mind. Why is this a thing? Who asked for this? Who gave this the all good? Why is my penis hard? Battlespire borrows exclusively the worst parts of Daggerfall and stretches them out into a 10 to 20 hour long experience. Gone are the towns and cities, no more are the guilds and political factions. Make way for hallways stacked on hallways, filled with ravenous bloodthirsty monsters. This is what you guys wanted, right? Says then Bethesda CEO Christopher Weaver, presumably wearing the smuggest of expressions. Originally, Battlespire was developed as an expansion for Daggerfall, hence the similarities. I'm yet to see one expansion for a game that focuses so heavily on combat make a positive addition to the source material. I mean, have you played Mothership Zeta? So Battlespire might not have the scope, scale, or intricately woven story of Daggerfall, but what does it have? Well, it looks pretty neat, I'll give it that. This is the first Elder Scrolls to finally have a consistent art style and tone. Battlespire would also be the first game to really take a more fleshed out look at some of the Daedric Princes, the lovable, psychotic gods of the Elder Scrolls universe. You know them, you love them, you probably have several of their trinkets on display at Bree's home. One other thing I can say about Battlespire is that it does go at great lengths to improve the dungeon experience from Daggerfall. You know, given that this game only takes place in dungeons, they kind of had to. For starters, no more randomly generated prefabs. It's all handcrafted now. Instead of an open world, Battlespire takes place across seven distinct stages. Instead of buying loot from vendors, the only items you'll have are what you start with and whatever you can scrounge along the way. Battlespire also says goodbye to experience gated progression, instead letting you spend class points on the transition between stages. This game's character creation is a whole can of worms. A particularly wriggly can of worms. If you thought it would just be a reissue of Daggerfall's mechanics, oh what a fool you are. Such a grand and intoxicating innocence. Honestly, I'm stunned by how any of this passed through the design team, let alone QA. Oh right, this is Bethesda we're talking about. Before you send the memes, Todd had nothing to do with this game, though he does have special thanks in the credits. He was working at Bethesda at the time, but had his hands full with more, shall we say, adventurous endeavours. Julian Le Fay was this project's lead designer. Le Fay is one of the founding fathers of the Elder Scrolls, one of the lead designers of the first entry, Arena. In contrast, this game's counterpart, Tez Adventures Redguard, was led by relatively new blood at Bethesda. So it's interesting to compare a game as wildly experimental for the series as Redguard with a game like Battlespire which is more of a callback to the dungeon crawlers that inspired Arena. Actually, it's more of a contrast than a comparison. The two couldn't be any more distinct from one another. Tonally, visually, narratively, and of course in gameplay. Which is also interesting as these two games were presumably being developed in the same room as one another. 
Also, both games utilise the same engine, Daggerfall's engine, OX engine. I really had hoped we would meet again, but here we are. I have to admit, calling this video an analysis is only slightly dubious. With games as old as this one, some things just aren't worth overanalyzing, for obvious reasons. So sometimes you just have to roll with the punches and take it as it is. We'll definitely be looking into the game's mechanics, storytelling and design, but with a decent chunk of lore splaining for people like me who are into that stuff. I think my previous video on Redguard leaned far too heavily on over-explaining and analysing things that really didn't need to be analysed, which contributed to that video being longer than it really had ought to have been. I'll probably come to the same conclusion about this video at some point too, but I'm also totally fine with these retrospectives serving as a kind of surrogate playthrough for people who would otherwise be unwilling or unable to give these older games a try. By the way, if you didn't know, I made a three and a half hour long video diving into the fever dream that is Tez Adventures Redguard. It's not the best video, but since I'm the only lunatic willing to cover these games in depth, you don't have many other ones to choose from. Haha. <laughs> I haven't seen sunlight in years. This retrospective is loosely divided into two elements. First being a look at each of the levels and the plot, and then on the back end, a deep dive into the not at all bodged together gameplay systems. Oh, and how could I forget the multiplayer? Because of course there's a multiplayer. Only Bethesda's best games have multiplayer. Wait, what the fuck? Is it supposed to do that? I don't think so. <laughs> Let's go! What the fuck? <laughs> What's it doing? <laughs> What's the little guy doing? Timestamps for all chapters will be in the description, as well as on the time bar thingy in case you want to skip ahead at any point. Unless YouTube decides to remove the chapters again for no discernible reason. Since this game runs in 4x3, you'll also be seeing the return of these lovely side panels that indicate each section. And I suppose I should address the glaring horny elephant in the room. Being an RPG made in 1997 naturally means the Battle Spire inherits the good old 90s charm, which of course includes a lot of nudity and questionable attitudes towards women. And don't worry, we're not going to go into a deep discussion about gamer sexism and the portrayal of women in pulp media. I'm certainly not advocating for any of that stuff either, but I'm also not qualified to have any real valuable opinion on these matters. I'm just here to make jokes and hoot and holler when I see an exposed nipple. Not that I can show much of that in a video. YouTube's content policies are an enigma sometimes, and I don't think I'll get away with showing some of this game's raunchier character sprites. So when necessary, I'm giving these pixelated ladies even more pixels just to be on the safer side. The game does have a child guard mode in the settings which also resolves this issue, but I ain't no prude, no sir. Anyway, we're all here to waste our precious hours on this earth by discussing video games online, and that's exactly what I aim to do. So with no further ramblings, let's begin our slow mental decline into what many would consider to be the other worst Elder Scrolls ever made. Battle Spire. I recall the story of the recovery of the Battle Spire, as it was told to me by the son of old Kimir these many years ago. The Battle Spire itself is a place of training and research for the battle mages who bolster the Empire's Department of Magical Defense. Since the Battle Spire exists in a slipstream realm of Aetherius, it's possible to access many of the worlds that lie beyond Mundus via teleportation from the Battle Spire. No records exist to our knowledge that detail the construction of the BS, but thanks to ESO and out-of-game sources, we know that its history dates back to at least the first era. The events of this game take place during the third era, and actually coincides with the timeline of the first game, Arena. Arena takes place over the span of ten years, during an event known as the Imperial Simulacrum, the name given to a series of wars which would erupt after the Emperor, Uriel VII, was betrayed by his Imperial Battle Mage, which is a separate rank from the Battle Mages, who are just mages who battle. I know, it's confusing and stupid. Jaegar Farn, through mastery of the arcane and deals with the Daedric Prince, Mayrunes Dagon, was able to shapeshift into the Emperor, take command of his kingdom, and then imprisoned him within the realm of Oblivion. Poor Paddy. 
His reign of terror was eventually put to an end by the protagonist of Arena, but like I said, this all takes place over 10 years. From 3rd Era 389 to 3rd Era 399, Battlespire takes place in the year 398, so just right at the end of this ordeal. I bring all this up because Battlespire does actually introduce lore that is relevant to the first game, so it's good to know what the hell I'm on about at the very least. Jula did a great in-depth video about Arena, its story, development, and gameplay. So if you want to know more, then I suggest that you add that to your watch later. Imperial Knowledge also has a good video that talks about the Battle Spire itself and what it's used for when it's not the subject of a 90s dungeon crawler. Going back to the BS, there was one Daedric Prince who had his eye on the Ethereal College for quite some time. Taking control of a direct link to navigate between the realms of Oblivion could prove a huge advantage for one's dubious little Daedric schemes. I mentioned him before, yes, it is the Angry Red Man, Mayrune's Dagon, Prince of Destruction, Evolution, and Ambition. He's once again the antagonist of this story. He can't keep getting away! Thanks to deals with the traitorous wizard Jagar Farn, Dagon was able to invade the BS whilst someone on the inside was holding the door open. Legions of hellish minions soon appeared and overran the tower, slaughtering all the mages inside, plundering and pilfering what goods they could find throughout the many magical rooms and treasuries. As the twisted weave of fate would have it, two apprentices from outside the spire were due for training that day. They had no idea what kind of fresh hell would await them as they crossed through the portal that links the BS to Tamriel. One of these apprentices is, of course, you, the player character. He or she is known in canon as simply the apprentice. The other is either Vatasha Tranel or Jazine Cade. It depends which sex you make your character. The other apprentice will always be the opposite. I'm gonna refer to them as your battle buddy because I think it sounds cute. Your battle buddy went in first before you, meaning that they are already on a deeper level of the BS by the time you get there. A series of notes left behind will inform you of their progress as you yourself go deeper and deeper into the realms under Dagon's siege. It's up to you to find your friend, battle the Daedra, and escape from this floating hell. Battlespire presents its story in a way that is kind of hard to follow. In fact, most of what I know about this game I learned from reading the wiki. Because the way information is presented on a wiki page is much easier to digest than piecing together dozens of notes and conversations, many of which are easily missed. Though I did read through most of those on the wiki as well. The very first thing you are asked to do when selecting new game is create a character. Yes, RPG fans will be relieved to know this game still has an in-depth character creation menu, just like Arena and Daggerfall. Except in this game, the systems are a little bit wacky, to put it lightly. Okay, well they, they were wacky in Arena and Daggerfall too, but um, <laughs> here. To say that whoever wrote these systems must have been on eight different types of narcotics, had a gun point into their head and blindfolded would also be putting things lightly. The final result is a class system that only has like one viable build. If you try and take a logical approach to creating a custom class, not using a guide and just relying on information the game provides, you're in for a bad time. These systems were churned out in the bowels of a mad god. So let me introduce you all to the unstoppable force. Some say he's wanted by the CIA and that he sleeps upside down like a bat. Some say that his politics are terrifying and that he once punched a horse to the ground. All we know is he's called Mr. Fister. This lovely Breton chap is my incredibly broken hand-to-hand -hand build that I put together from information I found on a reddit post. But this isn't even the most broken build, just the one that's easiest to make at level 1. There'll be a whole section of this video dedicated to character systems and other mechanics, but for now you only need to know a few things. Magic is tasty. Spell absorption is inarguably the most efficient way to gain mana points. Combined with a high intelligence pool and the restoration skill, and you can basically sustain your health for as long as enemies keep spamming you with magical attacks. Very broken and very easy to apply. Hit points. Your max HP is determined by how high you set your wounds at the start of the game. There is no way to increase max HP by any other method and it only increases by one-fifth of this number per level, so max out wounds now to avoid getting bodied later on. Item durability is very much a thing that exists, 
and when you have to manage multiple armor slots and weapons it can get very tedious very quickly. You can also be disarmed by opponents, which is quite frustrating when it happens. So just forget about the gear mechanics entirely. Don't use items, run around naked. High HP and restoration magic will be enough to tank through any kind of scenario this game can throw at you. Weapons? <laughs> A real man doesn't clobber his opponents with a hunk of iron, a real man uses his fists. At high levels, unarmed damage isn't too far off the damage you'd be dealing with a good blade. Your fists also level very quickly and damage scales with your skill and strength stat, so it won't be long until you're Oblivion's newest boxing champion. You may be looking at Mr. Fister's stat sheet and wondering why he's the least agile, frailest and unluckiest man to ever live. For now, let's just say that not everything in this game works as intended. If at all. Anyway, now we can actually talk about the Weir Gate, you know, that thing this part of the video is named after. This is the first level, and it's where you can really get a feel for all the game's bullshit. 90% of the footage you'll see online of people playing Battlespire is probably around here because only obsessed lunatics like myself have the patience to carry on further. Regardless, we're here and the way back is sealed, so the first thing we should do is look around and find out what's the sitch. If you're using the GOG version, you will notice that movement is broken, so be sure to go back and change this setting in the DOSBox INI. Then when you get back and realise the key bindings are made for dinosaurs, be sure to go into the menu and remap all of those. You'll soon find the welcoming committee of three scamps and one battle mage, presumably clawed to death by said scamps. Now don't be shy, go up and start a conversation, which is one of Battlespire's main gimmicks. You can talk to pretty much every enemy, but that doesn't mean it's always worthwhile. But I guess it does provide some relief in the otherwise planned combat exploration cycle this game adheres to. And everything is fully voice acted too, for all the flavour that adds. Give me the keys out of this place, or you'll be one sorry little monkey. Keys? Keys in dark, nasty place, near my tail. What, look, see? Hang on a minute. That voice, that's... After dealing with the welcome wagon, the control room is probably the best place to begin poking your nose. Behind one of the cabinets there is a secret room, occupied by some old geezer with a big glowing stick. What? Do you know who you're talking to, you whelp? I am Clarentavius, the Emperor's chief artificer and the only battle mage left alive in this power's forsaken wasteland. At first, Clarentavius is happy to see another living soul but he becomes quite dismissive once he realises it's only you and there's no one else coming to save him. Fortunately, he can enlighten us as to what we need to do if we hope to escape this place. We need to open up the Star Galley and close all the anchors in the Weir Gate that tether the Battle Spire to Aetherius, which in gameplay terms means running around and collecting sh**. The anchors are these neon blue cylindrical things. There's five of them and they're all easy enough to find. The anchors are closed when the blue thingies are touching, which is what we need to make sure of. To open the mechanical door to the star galley we need to get our grabbers on five separate cogs, which is not as straightforward of an ordeal. See, the level designers have a habit of putting important quest items in the inventories of seemingly random enemies, and because all enemies look the same there's no way of telling who might be carrying a key item. Sometimes you can kind of work out which enemies might be carrying an item, as some will not immediately attack you but first try to open dialogue. This isn't always reliable, as sometimes they can just be forced into aggro or they might not even try and talk to you at all. If you don't know all this game's item spawns off by heart, like me, please, please help me, then you should probably be killing every enemy just to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And some of these levels have well over a hundred enemies, so um, you know, get swinging. Or if you're clever, you'll just use a guide. Don't trick yourself into thinking you're a pro gamer for not using a walkthrough, you're just wasting your time. I'd otherwise advise against it, but here there's literally no other fun to be had. Unless you want to record yourself walking around in confusion for a few hours. You know, like pretty much everyone who plays this game ends up doing. Upon death, each enemy drops a sack. And yes, the implication that every Daedra carries around a cotton sack full of goodies is really funny. 
Some enemies can also drop entry sigils, which are basically this game's version of key cards. Yep, here we go with the Doom level design. The problem is that there's another identical item, also called a sigil, which are just one use magic items. They look the exact same as the key items, which you literally cannot progress without. I, I, I don't know why they did this. How they didn't think this would be confusing or misleading in any way just escapes me. I don't know why you wouldn't, at the very least, just make the key items a different colour. The only way to tell the difference at a glance is if you know that key items are sorted first when opening a sack. You know what, on the same note, I would make the enemies holding key items distinguish from normal enemies too. Make them glow or something. Say they're captains, give them a hat, anything. In terms of level design and layout, the Weir Gate is about as good as this game's levels get. The spawn room of the Weir Gate is essentially a place to get your bearings. There are five hallways leading out from this spawn room and you can go about in any direction you please. Some of the areas eventually cross paths and lead into much larger spaces. My main complaint is that most of the key items can be found very close to each other, meaning certain areas don't have any. This could lead to confusion or players thinking they missed something, but overall the level has a good layout and a clear objective, providing you can find Clarentavius hidden behind the filing cabinet. I mean, the area map does give away his room, but still. A bit of a weird place to put the guy given how important he is. Weirgate's enemy roster is comprised of Scamps, Dramora Lords, and Ganglefarts. Sorry, I mean Vermai. Ganglefart is my headcanon name for them. The Scamps and Vermai are basically just cannon fodder, and don't really have any higher mental faculties. Though Scamps are on the sillier side, just like me, for real for real. The Dramora are like Daedric noblemen, loyal to their clans and prince. They're relatively civil if you can get past their thirst for power and blood. They're also the kind of dudes who whack themselves over their IQ score, so be sure to give them a big wedgie whenever you see one. Indeed. Even as a mere animal, you tower above them in intellect. In much the same regard as we exceed your wits, I expect. I am Dramora Rathene. <clears throat> At this stage, humble groveling is customary accompanied by a handsome gift, or alternatively a lingering death may be your object. I'm obligated to mention that this game technically has a dragon. My obligation as a scholar of weird, unexplained lore tidbits across these games, of course. The name of this dragon is Papre, with an accent. The game engine can't render the letter E with an accent, so in game he's just called Papr. I guess the X engine just can't handle such powerful incantations. The only other dragon we know to be under the control of the Empire died at the hands of a Red Guard pirate over 400 years before the siege of the Battlespire. So the Empire seemingly just had a dragon on standby in the realm of Aetherius. Maybe he guards the place. You know, make of that what you will. One of the mages tried to mount the dragon during the siege and presumably fly back down to Tamriel because that's a thing you can apparently do from the Battlespire. Judging by the fact I'm showing you Papre's skeleton on screen, you can guess as to how that went. How did a whole ass dragon decompose this fast anyway? Were the scamps hungry? Did someone absorb its soul? Is Mr. Fista secretly a dragonborn? I'll let you decide because those theories are too schizo for even myself to entertain. Once all the cogs have been collected and the tips are touching, the apprentice can head back down to the star galley and open the door to the hangar. See, this thing is meant to be a ship of some sorts. Whether that's a metaphor or you literally use this thing to sail the skies of Aetherius, I'm not sure, because from the player's perspective, standing on it just instantly transports you away. There is one more thing in the Wiregate that I do want to mention because it's just so fucking strange, even for this game. If you find this secret area under the star galley, you'll be able to meet this giant turtle sticking out of the wall. He's said to be a scholar of many disciplines, including the metaphysical. Feel free to climb all over him, he doesn't really mind. In fact, I think he likes it. Once you've had your fun, you can exit his room and board the star galley, which will whisk you off to the magical land of level 2. Don't worry about Clarentavius, I'm sure he'll be fine. Moving on to administration, which is, you guessed it, the administrative wing of the Battlespire. Only one new enemy is introduced in this level, and that is the Spider Daedra, who only appear on this level. 
They could also be found on Tez 4 after a certain point, although they appeared to have had a sex change. I was just wondering, all I've heard about the sex life of spiders is pretty dire. So, are you, do you, is it like, Deck? Deck? You mean eggs and reproduction? That's boring, mortal stuff. We get off on hurting things, like you. Thanks for clearing that up for me. The battle mages who worked up here must have been eternally bored, because it seems like half the doors are locked behind riddles. Trust wizards to make the simple act of opening a cupboard as convoluted as possible. Some of these are quite challenging and might take you a while to figure out, so you could do that, or you could just go grab the scroll that has all the answers on it. I mean, I'm not complaining because now I don't have to tab out the game to look up the answers, but what was the point of having the riddles in the first place if you were just going to tell me the answers? Was it meant to be challenging or not? Make up your mind. One common complaint I see is that the game doesn't give you any information as to what you're meant to do on each stage, which is false, because usually around spawn on every level you can find a pretty detailed note that can point you in the right direction, but honestly asking me to read a bunch of scrolls and figure out what I'm meant to do is always going to be less desirable than just reading a guide beforehand. So I don't blame anyone for getting lost on these levels, especially if you've only had the luxury of playing modern games that have much smoother input. I can see how this might all be overwhelming. In regards to the story, we still don't get many answers during this level, but here's what I can tell you. Our battle buddy has successfully disguised themselves as a minion of Dagon, and is sticking close to a Dremora Lord named Samir. Samir hopes to use the Spire's cross-dimensional teleporter, but it won't function without a device called the Void Guide. We need to go meet the guy so we can fix up and then use his teleporter. Only problem is that he's on a deeper level of the administration wing, an area we first have to get to using an internal teleporter. If you know what you're doing, then you can fly past the first half of this stage and reach Samir in about 60 seconds or less. All you need to do is kill a spider Daedra to get his sigil, go down to another part of the map, grab a piece of the void guide and then go talk to this little girl, who's actually not a little girl mind you, but rather the Daedra in charge of all the scamps. So naturally, she's a little bit of a scamp herself. You lose! <laughs> That door goes to the special secret parts of Battle Spire, where Samir is. He's very important. I'm supposed to bring him the Void Guide, and he'll give me a nice present. But you can't go to the secret parts yet, because I can't go to the secret parts yet. Not until I get the Void Guide, and you can't go if I can't go. That's fair, isn't it? But if you give her the piece of the Void Guide, she'll disappear and let you access the teleporter that links to the next part of administration. Samir is in charge of all the Dramora here. He's looking for the pieces of the Void Guide so he can boot up his teleporter and head back home. Initially, if you talk to him, he'll send his minions to attack you. Or just crash your game. If you had a mother, I'm sure she'd be ashamed of your awful <laughs> I'm not kidding, this response will just crash your game most of the time. You'll notice that he called the player Trinell. There's this running gag where all the Daedra constantly confuse the player for the other apprentice, despite them being the opposite gender. I think it's meant to show how the Daedra are so far removed from mortal affairs that they can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. After all, Daedra are sexless and just take the appearance of whatever they fancy. But come on, these guys have to know what boobs are for. They can't be that fucking fig. Even if you initially insult Samir, you can still agree to form an alliance with him and go search for the Void Guide pieces. I think he might have a minor case of dementia. Maybe he spent some time in service to Shagarath. Who knows? There are five pieces in total, all scattered around the map thanks to the lovely scamps we talked about earlier. Search around, start clicking on things, click on everything, you'll find them eventually. The trickiest piece to acquire is guarded by the chief of the spider Daedra, one Sharla. It's not possible to outright kill her. She tells the apprentice that if we can bring her the mace known as Scourge, as well as its keyword to activate the weapon, she will part with her piece of the guide. Scourge is an interesting little piece of kit. It's an artifact blessed by the Daedric Prince Malakath, who's sort of a patron deity for outcasts in all regions of Tamriel from orcs to ogres to the natives of the Reach. The Lord himself is even shunned by his fellow princes, who don't even consider him to be a true god. I mean, one story says that the guy is literally the world's biggest turd. If you don't know what I'm on about, then consider yourself lucky. 
I consider him to be one of the more based Daedric Princes, personally. Maybe I'm just green-pilled. Malakath is also known as the God of Curses, his artifact Scourge being no exception. However, only Daedra have to fear the power this mace can invoke, as Scourge is a weapon dedicated to mortals to spite the other Daedra. It was even once used against the very same forces of Meirun's Dagon during a previous invasion. Now it finds itself here, in the secret compartments of the Battlespire, neglected because none of the guards or wizards fought to invoke the power of a weapon whose sole purpose is to fight off angry demons. It has one other notable property too. Any Daedra who try to wield the mace will be banished into the void, something that the Skyrim Creation Club DLC seemingly overlooked by giving the item to a Dremora. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. When we deliver the mace to one Sharla, much like the Creation Club developer, she has no idea of the item's history, and is banished to the void as she tries to betray us. Scourge, I invoke thee in the name of equality. And with this power, I may now rid myself of your irksome stink. But... what? Oh! Ah, God! During the search for Scourge's keyword, the apprentice will be intercepted by a Dremora messenger, not the usual kill on sight kind. This is a servant of the Dremora clan leader, Imago Storm, a character who won't really come up again until much later. Let's just say that not all the clans of Dagon wish to see us destroyed, and would instead bargain with us, for what they have in mind can benefit us both. He hands us a book that informs us of some of the common beliefs held by the Daedra. This book is called Spirit of the Daedra, a lore text that has appeared in every mainline entry since Battlespire. It's mostly a synopsis for how the Daedra operate, how they adhere to oaths and bonds. It mentions how they feel pain, shame, loss, and how they must master fear to overcome it. It details what they think of mortals, how they are seen as prey, but secretly applaud when they manage to evade death. Oh, those clever humans, always finding new ways to not die. The relationship between the Daedra and mortals is quite interesting. Given that the Daedric gods had nothing to do with the creation of life, you'd think that Daedra would be far removed from such affairs. Even the lesser Daedra who have their own realms of oblivion to call home. Although some are arguably better off than others, can't say I'd want to hang out in the quagmire for all eternity. To the Daedra, there are actually sometimes benefits to dealing with mankind, whether that means through plunder or negotiation. The endless inventions of mortals, both arcane and mundane, are just too sweet a delicacy for them to pass up on, such as the Battlespire, which is so valuable to Dagon that he made deals with Jay Garfarn in order to get his hands on it. All four of them. With the Mean Lady dead, we're able to snag the last piece of the Void Guide and head back to Samir who upon returning all the pieces tells us that he expects a full report on our return after testing the teleporter. A report he'll never receive as Mr. Fister has no intention of coming back. We are now leaving the slipstream realm in which the Battlespire resides, and boldly voyaging further into the depths of oblivion. The first realm of oblivion we end up in is known as the Soul Khan. You know, that place with the undead dragon and the vampire mommy. They should be around here somewhere. The Soul Khan here in Tez Battlespire differs a little bit from the Soul Khan we see in Skyrim's Dawnguard expansion, but it is the same place. The Soul Khan is a realm of oblivion, but has no Daedra to lord over it. Instead, the ideal masters are who you'd call in charge around these parts. Who they are, what they do, or what their motives really are, we don't know. They speak to us through these floating crystals which lie sealed away under ancient coffins. Whether this is their actual form or just how they choose to communicate to mortals, once again, we don't know. I'm gonna dip into lore from Skyrim and ESO here, but bear with me. The Ideal Masters were once mortal wizards, who shed their corporeal form and decided to construct the Soul Khan in the Realm of Oblivion. They are driven solely by a desire to bring more and more souls into the Khan, for whatever reason. They're reluctant to even spend a shred of energy on anything else because doing so could, quote, diminish their eternity. Wizards on Mundus can use soul gems to trap the souls of victims, harvesting their life essence as an ingredient for arcane practices, typically enchanting magics. 
In doing so, whether knowingly or not, they invoke a bargain with the ideal masters, where in exchange for the victim's soul, they can hire said magical energy. This is not the only thing soul gems can be used for, as other kind of soul magic is known to exist. Soul gems have also been used to preserve life, seemingly keeping a person's life essence inside the gem until magic can be used to either restore them to their bodies or some other form. Such as Prince Ator during the Second Battle of Stroh's Mackay, whose soul wound up being infused with his sword, which seemingly gave the weapon a will of its own. This might not have anything to do with the ideal masters and their soul magic, we're not sure how any of this works, but it just works. And no, I didn't just bring all that up so I could plug my Redguard retrospective video, but now that I mention it. The ideal masters themselves describe the Soul Khan as a place of peace, love, eternal rest, and harmony for those who pass into their service, though the residents here might beg to differ. Slowly they start to lose any memory of their former lives until they just become these raving spectral husks, eternally in service to their new masters, robbed of whatever afterlife they hoped had awaited them. In other words, they're spooky skeletons that try and kill you. We couldn't have had one f***ing RPG without the jolly little bone boxes, could we? Souls of animals and creatures can also find their way into the Soul Khan, but they end up in the Soul Zoo on a different part of the plane. Unfortunately, we won't be making the trip to the zoo today, but we'll still be seeing plenty of sights, don't you fret. The cross-dimensional travels of Mr. Fister will see us tracing the path of destruction created by Dagon's army during his march towards the BS. See, in order to get from his realm to the BS, Dagon would have to weave his way through the tangled web of oblivion in order to reach the Spire. Much of Dagon's army after conquering the BS is now pulling back, and retracing the very same path back to his realm. However, Daedra were also eager to keep a grasp on the Soul Khan because of something called the Emerald Gates, a teleporter device that is conveniently our way out of here, once we figure out where to go. By the time the Apprentice arrives, the only remnants of Dagon's army are these Morphoid Daedra. These guys are intelligent, shape-shifting Daedra, I think. They never appear in any other game and don't even have their own wiki page. They're here to maintain a watch over the Soul Khan and make sure that Mr. Fister and his battle buddy are captured before they can cause too much trouble. By this point, the Daedra are well aware that two mortals have been skulking about amidst Dagon's army and are eager to capture us. The wraiths you can find mulling about in this area are super annoying. They have an absolutely absurd amount of health. I can't imagine the designers expected the player to even try and kill these guys and instead just run away. But then I started punching one and it bled. And if it bleeds, you know what that means. I think it took a good few minutes of non-stop fisting to kill just one of these guys. There are 27 wraiths on this level, and this is the only one I bothered to kill. You can find a scroll that will allow you to banish them through dialogue, but I didn't know that, so I just had to put up with them chasing me around like some Scooby-Doo skit. One chap in particular, Pax the Bator, was only recently turned into one of these fellas. Until recently, he was a mage at the Spire, and can still recall the event that led this invasion to unfold. He was tricked into opening the Void Gate and allowing Dagon's army to run their way through. The one doing the tricking being Saran Angada, a servant of Jaegar Farn, everyone's favourite shadow wizard. Although not directly treason, you could see opening up the portal as a treacherous act because Come on, what good would that do? So you have a few choices here. You can leave Paxty B, you can attack him, or providing you know the incantation, you can banish him. The first half of this dungeon is short and straightforward. Kill goons, take sigil, move on to the next area. The Soul Khan is probably the most linear of all the stages overall, until you get past this jumping puzzle and into the second half, where things get a bit less obvious. You'll come across this boat inside a cavern. You can eventually row the boat here to reach this jetty on the other end. Rowing works surprisingly well. That's all I can say about that. You can also just swim. Here you can pick up an entry sigil and another note from your battle buddy. Turns out their disguise could only work for so long and they're now relying on stealth and magic to get around. They're heading for something called the Emerald Gates, another teleport device and the reason the Soul Khan is of such value to Dagon. They're off to a place called Shade Perilous, a plane belonging to Nocturnal, and hopefully we'll see them on the other side. The Emerald Gates are located in the Chapel of Love, but to figure out how to open the gates we need to have a conversation with the owners of this realm. 
the ideal masters. The only way to talk to them is by opening up their coffins and speaking to these floating crystals. You are not invited here. Why do you disturb our rest? All the coffins, by the way, are locked with yet more riddles. Again, the answers to which can be located earlier in the level. Most of the ideal masters will refuse to cooperate with the apprentice, instead telling them to first join their service in exchange for any kind of help. And there's only one way to go about joining them. Put off your mortal garments and stand naked in the spirit. Your stained tablet must first be washed white by the fires of mana. Seek the twin fingers of life in the chapel of love. Stand upon the pedestal and bathe yourself in the mana beams. The corruption of the flesh shall fall away and the spirit shall be revealed in its glory. Then may you stand before us and serve for eternity in peace and joy. In other words, they just tell you to kill yourself. There is, however, one of these masters who can be persuaded into cooperating. He, she, or it will agree to spill the beans on how exactly we can hope to get out of here. First, we must find three rods. The rods are thick and slippery and can prove difficult to track down, even if using a guide. Seriously, what the fu- Out of all the things you could have had the player collect, why this? Thankfully, they are all located in the second half of the map, so you won't need to backtrack too far. They also function as enchanted items that you can use from your inventory. You can even break them, but thankfully it doesn't affect the quest. After you've wrapped your hands around all three rods, make your way to the Chapel of Love. There's a few danger here, so you may want to take them out before doing anything else. All you do here is activate these two magicka resonators, then head up to the platform and slam your rods into the Chapel of Love. Slam bam mamma jam. Now if you don't know where you're going, this teleporter will be useless to you, since to travel you just enter the gates and speak the name of the realm you wish to visit. It could be anywhere. Here, there, Uncle Sweet shares. The only place the game will allow us to go is the Shade Perilous, a fortress deep in the Evergloom, home for the Nocturnals. Lady of the Night, Mistress of the Shadows, the Daughter of Twilight. For the Daedric Prince of Darkness, you wouldn't think Nocturnal's realm would be so well lit. That is a stupid thing to say. But I'm not complaining, the render distance is painful enough as is. Shade Perilous seems to be a fortress for nocturnal shrikes. Here, the magicka flows like wine, thanks to these mana beams located deeper in the castle. Which, I'd take a good guess, is why Dagon's forces have decided to overrun the joint. Dagon's orders were originally not to siege the Shade Perilous, but merely just pass through on his way to the Battle Spire. These new orders instead come from Dagon's overzealous lieutenants, Phaedra Shardai and Zivilai Moath. Instead of just passing through the realm, the two clan leaders instead saw fit to occupy and plunder the fortress, much to the delight of their underlings, who we can find quite literally having a blast in the hallways. A party crasher! Wicked little party crasher! Did you think we would not notice your wicked intrusion into our new banquet hall? Interloper! This realm is not for your brittle kind. Who you calling brittle, ice boy? Fire and Frost Daedra are the newest revelers in the Shade Perilous. The two would otherwise be natural enemies, but their clans are both an alliance to Dagon and are sworn to play nice with one another, begrudgingly. The Fire Daedra being from the clan of Phaedra Shardai, and the Frost Daedra being from the clan of Zivilai Moath. Through dialogue, you can convince either or to give you an enchanted item if you promise to only attack the other. They'll still attack the player though, and they can't be coerced into attacking one another. Still, that's an actual interesting piece of flavour dialogue, and I'll take what I can get from this game. Further into the halls of the Shade Perilous, you'll also come across quite a few seducers. The seducers were originally here under the employ of Nocturnal. These are the same Mazkin who also occupy Shegaraf's Plain, the Shivering Isles. Many of them are known to wander from the realm of the Mad God and find themselves in alliance with the other princes. Due to their clanless nature, they are notoriously treacherous. It's no wonder that when Dagon gave them a sweeter deal, they turned on Nocturnal and imprisoned her shrikes. 
The seducers who were loyal to Dagon were granted greater powers and given bat wings, because Dagon's freaky like that, I guess. Dark Seducer is the name given to these more powerful temptresses, but I just call them level 3 sentry turrets because that's what role they serve in this game. Not all the seducers betrayed Nocturnal. Plenty of the unchanged Mazkin can still be found wandering the Shade Perilous, but most of them remain hostile. The Apprentice is an intruder here after all. Even the friendly ones ended up getting pummeled by Mr. Fister because I didn't know they might be friendly at the time. One of Nocturnal Shrikes has been captured and is being detained in the Gay Baby Jail. Our battle buddy is nowhere to be seen though we can learn from a chatty Dramora that they too have been captured. However, they have been taken by Dagon personally to his hunting lodge in the Deadlands. Ah, shucks. You're gonna make me run an oblivion portal? Really, Bethesda? Really? We can also snag a note containing the password needed to open up one of the rooms in the jail. The Geraint of Dagon rules here. Pop that sucker in and watch that bad boy open up. Inside, you'll find a pair of boobs. This rack belongs to Nocturnal's lesser lieutenant, Deianira, one of these shrikes I mentioned. She can't help us in any way with our quest, but knows someone who can. The greater lieutenant, JC or Morgan. Unfortunately, she's asleep right now, so we have to go wake her up. But of course, it's not that easy. First, we have to get the magicka flowing through the castle again to open up the night portal. We can do this by reactivating the magicka tourbillons in the big magic room, but to reach the night portal, we also have to flick four secret levers, all hidden in different parts of the map. In other words, oh jolly, oh joy, I sincerely love do x random thing to make y happen level design. This might be the most Daggerfall-esque dungeon left in this game, and this level is quite big, so if you have Mark and Recall available, I suggest you use it. You should have the Cloak of Precipitous Travel from the Mock Turtle's room that will allow you to use such magic, if you bother to pay him a visit. You know how I refer to the Dark Seducers as flying sentry turrets? Well, here's a good example of that. There's this area in the lower portion of the map containing a big platform and bridge you have to cross to get to one of the levers. This area is just jammed with these enemies to the point where I can only consider this to be some kind of sick joke on behalf of the level designer. And these things are not easy to kill, not even on their own and especially not in groups like this. That's not even the worst part though. The spells they cast have a severe knockback effect. At least they did on me. I don't know if knockback is tied to weaknesses or not wearing armor or something. Maybe. Anyway, if you get knocked off, you have to swim all the way through the water back to the platform, likely to get knocked off again as soon as you make it back. Don't be like me. Use the ethereal effect from sigils. I wish I'd thought of that sooner. But don't worry, because this section is just a primer for a whole level full of this shit later on. After much wandering around, collecting sigils, using teleporters and flicking switches, you'll fight your way to the Wheels of Heaven. This is where your knowledge of the Daedric language will come in handy, as we have to spell out the word Dusk in order to get the magic of flowing. The sequence in which you traverse around this room is indicated by furniture. No, I'm not kidding, Deianira even mentions this. Most letters in the Daedric alphabet alphabet kind of resemble their corresponding Roman characters, so it's quite easy to just guess your way through this puzzle. The worst that can happen is that you take a bit of damage. When you've solved the code and turned all the wheels of heaven, a secret room will open up. Hopefully you've found all the levers by this point and can make your way to the night portal. If not, then sorry bucko, it's backtracking time. Something that the Shade Perilous is notably terrible for, even if you know what you're doing. JC or Morgan can be found down here, asleep, her mind in a state of deep melancholia, woven tightly to the dream sleeve, Amimir. She's in a depression from the loss of the Shade Perilous, and there's nothing that can snap her out of this state. Nothing except the mention of her love, Deyanara. The shackles that bind me are far stronger than any mere magics. I shall remain here alone. Let the Nocturnals come and find me stricken here. They will punish me, but they will punish the Dagon far more. There will be war in the heavens, the sky will crack, and the earth will split in two. All mortal things must perish in this howling storm of fire and night. Ah, uh, that sounds like it would be bad. It will be glorious. I mean, I think the implication is that Jaciel and Deianira are lovers. 
Fellas, is it gay if two sexless immortals who both take the form of a human female fall in love? Do you think the Daedra have pride rallies? Still, not even news of Daenerys' safety is enough to snap Jaceel out of her depression nap. And without Jaceel's help, we have no hope of getting out of this place. Long story short, Daenerys will come up with the idea that the Apprentice must banish her to oblivion, provoking Jaceel out of her depression through rage. When the deed is done, we go show Jaceel the blade, and yeah, she's pissed. You bastard! You tricked her into this to serve your own selfish ends. I should tear your beating heart out and force you to eat it in tiny bites, one wriggling, beating bite each century. I should flay the skin from your body and hurl your living carcass into the sea of my salty tears. But in the end, she just figures, eh, he's immortal. Mortals pull this kind of shit all the time to save their hides. So she gives the apprentice the password for the night portal, Gemikwe. I should note, it's entirely possible to skip the subplot between Jaceel and Dayanera if you know the password beforehand. She still shows up later in the game, regardless of if you even talk to her or not. Anyhow, after a little bit of hardcore parkour, we proceed, but not before being intercepted by another Dremora informant. He has some good news and some bad news. The good news is that the Clan of Amargo Storm can help us rescue our battle buddy from the clutches of Mehrun's Dagon. The bad news is that instead of taking the Night Portal into Dagon's fortress, the destination has been tampered with, and we are now about to be hunted by hairy demon men. Oh yes, there will be a hunt, and we are to be the prey. Or at least that's what they seem to think. Clearly they haven't seen Mr. Fister in the ring. After all the hallowed hallways and dank dungeons we've had to delve through, the Chimera should feel like a holiday. Instead of tight box corridors, we are instead met with a whole island to explore. In any other game, this kind of environment would be par for the course. But here it's just so far removed from anything we've seen so far that it's the last thing you expect. Complete tonal whiplash, but in the best way. That feeling soon wears off in about 20 minutes along with the novelty, but for now just enjoy the fresh air. Cicely Island was once part of Tamriel, a small piece of land off the coast of High Rock, but Dagon sent the whole place packing into the void as a form of revenge after being duped by a mortal conjurer. One who we can still meet on the island, but he's worthy of a whole discussion when we get to that part. As well as being one big eternal prison, the Chimera has other uses to the Daedra. On occasion, they use this realm for their hunts, the most recent of which we have been unwillingly chosen as the game to be hunted. As soon as you spawn into the docks, a dark seducer will begin to spit bars at you. Listen, mortal, and listen well. Here are your masters, and here is your hell. The wild hunt begins this day. We are the hunters, and you are the prey. Oh yeah, we make it out of Breville with this one. The seducer is the master of the hunt. Also, she's one of the only dark seducers in the game that has a dialogue, and her window animations aren't exactly polished. But then again, neither is anything about Battlespire. The wild hunt is actually a her scene ritual, who is the Daedric Prince of the hunt and also furries. Not to be confused with the Bosma ritual of the same name, the Great Hunt, or Wild Hunt, or Ritual of the Innocent Quarry, is an event in which a hare is chosen to be the prey. The hare must either escape or be captured by his hunters and killed. Her scene is never mentioned throughout this game, so it's safe to say that he is not lording over this particular hunt. That honour goes to Phaedra Shardai, aforementioned clan leader and adoptive child of Mehrun's Dagon. Like any good convoluted Daedric ritual, the hunt has rules. The kill must be performed by a huntsman wielding the Spear of Bitter Mercy. In this case, the huntsmen are the Herns. The hare must be given a fair chance of escape. The hare cannot harm the huntsman in any way. They are to flee and evade their hunters. There are also rules for the lesser dogs and the greater hounds, Frost and Fire Daedra respectively. There's also a big-brained philosophical element to this whole shebang. The ritual pits the all-powerful huntsmen and their greater and lesser dogs against the pitiful and doomed innocent quarry, called by tradition the Hare, after the mortal creature of human hunts. At once, the huntsman is transported by the exquisite thrill and glory of his might and dominion over the helpless prey, 
and at the same time touched by the tragic, noble, and ultimately futile plight of the innocent quarry. In the highest aesthetic realisation of the ritual, the ecstatic rapture of the kill is balanced by the huntsman's identification with the sadness and despair of the innocent quarry. As in pieces the body of the innocent hare is torn, the huntsman reflects on the tragic imbalances of power and the cruel injustices of the world. I'll let you draw your own meanings from that. It is nice to see some text in-game that makes the Daedra more believable and, dare I say, down to earth. Can we get more Daedra lore like this please instead of her scene literally being reduced to chief unicorn exterminator? Thanks Bethesda. But would it really be a hunt if the prey had no chance of escape? No, that would be an execution. And there's no sport in that. Several landmarks are found scattered around the Chimera. At each location it's possible for the hare to find one of six keys. Once all these keys have been located, the hare can do a runner to the Horn Temple and hopefully escape the dreaded Huntsman's Spear. Apparently, the hunted has never escaped during any of these hunts in the past, and assuming these shindigs have been kicking since the dawn of time, those are some rough odds. And to stack the odds even higher, one of those keys is in the possession of the head huntsman, Hearn Egerhearn, a beautiful name for a beautiful hairy man. This is a violation of the law of the hunt, but whoever's in charge doesn't seem to care. Although fellow participants of the hunt will express their discontentment with this clear violation of the rules. As mentioned, the Hearns are completely invulnerable to attacks, but fortunately we will be able to find a way around that rule in the case of Egerhearn within due time. But the keys aren't the only important items dotted around the map. The armour of the Saviour's Hide is another artefact that we need to collect all six pieces of for reasons. Reasons that we'll go over in a little while. In total, there are 12 separate items that we'll need to get our hands on over the course of this level. But to be fair, given the nature of this particular level, it's not as bad as it sounds. It, it is still quite bad though. While there are many unique locations, most of them aren't that interesting. There's also quite a ways to go between sites, meaning that a lot of your time in the Chimera will be spent traversing its desolate wastes. Even with a map handy, it's easy to get lost due to how similar everything looks. The Chimera quickly turns from a fun novelty to a huge pain in the rump. Oh, and mind the locals. There's a combined 154 elemental daedra on the island, and they're basically the only enemies you'll see beside the unkillable hands. Thank the divines for spell absorption. You really shouldn't plan on staying here for too long, as there's a bug on this particular level that slowly melts your save data. Basically, every time that the level is loaded from the menu, it creates junk entries for game objects, until it gets to the point where the save becomes too bloated and can no longer be used. Apparently you can work around this bug by loading a save from a previous level, then loading a save in the Chimera, but I wouldn't know because I never spent that long here. If you're just bum rushing through this level like me, you should be okay to just save and load as normal, but just be aware that constantly restarting DOSBox and jumping into the Chimera will eventually fuck up your save beyond repair. It doesn't help that the game resets itself whenever you die, so try not to do that too often here. Not that you should be having a hard time if you follow the advice I'll give in a later segment, but if you can't help it then at least use the workaround. While on the topic of melting your game, I thought it would be fun to read just a few of the known bugs in Battlespire from the wiki, because some of them are quite funny. The resist fire effect is broken, it never works. If you pause while on a moving lift, your position is paused but the lift movement isn't. When you unpause, you're sitting at the bottom, can be deadly if it's a high lift. Getting stuck in the void, sometimes you fall or just walk through a wall or crack forcing a reload. Mobs get stuck on, well, anything. A magical cape found on level 2B is actually a pair of pants. Sometimes when loading a save from inside the tower in the cave in level 5, the player will spawn underwater, dying instantly. Bookcase graphic on level 1 and level 6 is placed upside down. Some monsters disappear and come back to life after you kill them sometimes. Boats and balloon disappear when you exit them. Balloon does return to mooring place eventually, but where do boats go? Some of those purple healing crystals are really big. Is this on purpose? 
The orb that teleports you to Dagon's throne room may do nothing at all, making the game unwinnable. Sky turns black in the Chimera after loading a save. A chest containing a key item that trolls you by sometimes not containing the item, and you just have to keep opening it from different angles until you get the item. <laughs> Occasionally, unequipping items can cause the game to freeze. Touching the ceiling can cause the game to freeze. Clicking on windows in the Chimera can cause the game to freeze. Opening a menu screen in the Chimera can cause the game to freeze. Playing on Windows 95 can cause the game to freeze. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Moving on. Shrouded by a thick sea mist, near the northernmost part of the Chimera there rests a lonely wooden lodge. Creaking open the door and stepping inside, we are greeted by the only other non danger on this entire rock. <coughs> he doesn't get too many guests nowadays. Keep ye back! Keep ye back! It takes a little while to convince him that we are human, but eventually he'll chill the fuck out. So you may be wondering, why is there a random old man living alone in a cottage within this realm of oblivion? So I suppose we should delve into that. Camille Gregan was not always the arthritis ridden greybeard you see before you. Once he held the title of Master Summoner for the Dereni clan, back when they hadn't been written to be an elven faction yet. Sometime before 3rd era 172, Chimere came to possess the armour of the Saviour's Hide, an artefact said to be made from the very hide of her scene himself, a powerful barrier that grants the user a resistance to all forms of magic. So Camille decided to don the armour and strike a pact with Daddy Dagon, you know, as you would. The terms of this deal aren't clear to us, but what is clear is that Chimere intended to trick Dagon by casting an incantation on the prince. An incantation is like a verbal form of magic, in this case utilising Dagon's protonymic. A protonymic is basically his true name, his secret name, and in the world of the immortals, names hold power. Incantary names will come to be a very important part of the plot, but we'll open up that can of worms later. Anyway, this dubious little scheme to double-cross the devil backfired. Dagon's power was being drained by the use of his protonymic, and although he could not directly harm Kamir, who was wearing Hercene's hide, he channeled what power he had left into one final act of vengeance. He ripped the entire island of Cecily out of Nern and cast it into oblivion, along with Chimere and all the townsfolk. The villagers of Cecily were soon slain by the Daedra, though arguably Kamir was dealt a fate much worse. Cursed with eternal life and bound to this dimension, Dagon also ensured that the tormented voices of the dead would live on in Kymir's memory forever. So naturally he's fucking insane. Mayhap ye are a delusion of the mind, a bit of undigested pudding. To get anything helpful out of the guy, we first have to put up with his ramblings and impossible missions he sends the apprentice on, the first of which is to track down his missing spoon. There is, of course, no spoon. This is just a wild goose chase. He'll also ask the prince to track down a flock of kittens. Sadly, there are no kittens. Eventually though, we can pry from his brain some information that isn't just verbal garbage. We can ask how exactly he managed to trick Dagon and drained his powers all those years ago. Chimere will tell the apprentice Dagon's protonymic, Lakalaga, but says that it will do us no good as surely by now he's added a neonymic, a new name in addition to his protonymic. Basically, Dagon got hacked, so now he's added a few digits to his password. Chimere also tells us of the Savior's hide, the pieces of which he's hidden around the island. Hercene's hide will not only be instrumental in our final battle against Dagon, but also in getting our hide out of the Chimera. The Saviour's hide is particularly effective against Oath Breakers, and will protect us against the attacks of one. By pocketing one of the six keys, the Huntsman Egerhorn has broken the lore of the hunt. You can see where this is going. Finally, we need a weapon to arm ourselves with. The Spear of Bitter Mercy, the only weapon capable of being used by the Hare to harm the Hunters. The case can just be found lying in the Chapel of the Innocent Quarry. You know, just over here in the corner. Because of course it is, why wouldn't it just be in some random corner? Are you thick? Only after obtaining all six pieces of the Saviour's Hide, five of the keys and the spear case, can we head back to Chimere's cabin and have him open up the ting. 
There isn't just one Spear of Bitter Mercy, by the way. The Hearns all have one too. Fun fact, in case you were wondering how other princes like Shegarath could end up with one. All suited up and ready to roll, we have only the Guardian of the Final Key left to deal with. Hearn Egerhearn, the Oathbreaker, Master Huntsman and youngest of the Hearns. He can be found around the town on the north end of the map. The town is situated on an island which is accessible via drawbridge. Now there's a few ways you could possibly get here. You can either swim around the back and take the lift up, if you have high enough skill you can jump in, or there's my favourite method, taking the hot air balloon into town. Why is there a hot air balloon? Where did it come from? Why is it here? What are the lore implications of this? You ask too many questions. Glancing at our spear, Egerhorn mockingly entertains our feeble attempt at trickery, believing that the spear we possess must be a fake. That thing? That wouldn't even fool a scamp. Well, perhaps. It does look remarkably like a real spear. I salute you. A magnificent bluff. A fake? Mate, you wanna bet? <laughs> After being proven wrong, we can take the key from his goodie bag and make haste towards the Horn Temple, also located in the very same town. Trust me, you, you can't miss it. You should know the drill by now. Once there, just take the lift up to the top and step through the teleporter to get beamed into whatever fresh hell is waiting for us next. The fortress of Mayrunes Dagon, inhabited by his most loyal clan leaders, Zivilai Moath, Phaedra Shardai, and Amargo Storm. This is where they garrison their troops and park their siege equipment. The level begins in a forest. After a short glide past a few herns and seducers, we can find ourselves staring up at the gate that marks entry into the Havoc Wellhead. The way to open this gate is exactly as stupid as it looks. Unlike most other levels, the fortress actually has a pretty decent layout, so it's easier to make sense of things. Upon entry, we are greeted by the locals in this large courtyard area, full of siege weapons and tents. From here, the wellhead has three separate wings. In the east, we can find Zivilai Moath. To the west, Phaedra Shardai, and Amargo keeps himself in his little castle within a castle up north. The Havoc Wellhead introduces a few new types of Daedra, as well as reintroducing some old chums with updated dialogue, such as new lines for the Scamps, who are now rightly terrified of Mr. Fista. Daedra Lords can be encountered on this level. There aren't many of them, but they are tough. One of the few enemies that are actually a struggle to fight, especially in groups. They're quite intelligent and would consider it an honour to slay us, which I suppose can be taken as a compliment. Watch out for their spells, they're the only magical attack in the game that deals damage over time. And yes, it does stack the more they hit you. Clan Fear at this level spam enemy, along with the Hearns which are now killable. Clan Fear are much smarter than they might appear, but all in all probably about as bright as your average Redditor. Threatens us, does it? The Hearns aren't too happy about us doing Egerhorn dirty back in the Chimera, but come on, he shouldn't have broke his oath then. The Seducers are also back, this time with the ability to seduce the player character. Does my form please you? Would you taste of its delight? <laughs> I feast upon your life force, mortal. Hot and juicy, trembling. A gush of fluids, a split in skin, and gone forever. What a glorious After the courtship, no lover's comfort will be earned, but half of your health will be mysteriously missing. No, I'm not going to make the joke. There's also a couple tiny scamps which are purely just meme enemies, since they both have about 10,000 hit points. For reference, my fists deal 15 to 17 damage at this stage. I'll let you crunch those numbers. But don't bother killing them because they don't carry any special goodies. Believe me, I, I checked. As much as I'd love to fist away through these halls all day, there's someone who we should first pay a visit. Imago Storm, the chief of the Dramora clan, and our mysterious little pal who's been aiding and informing us throughout our adventure. It took me a while to figure out how to open the gate to get to him. It turns out you just have to play the bongo. There's no sound effect, but don't worry because I can soon add one. Once you're in his crib, you can take the lift up and go talk to the esteemed gent himself. 
So now we have to talk about that fun thing that everyone loves to talk about, politics. More specifically, the politics of conniving shape-shifting demons. So basically just politics. To put it simply, the invasion of the Battlespire has been an absolute disaster for Dagon's party. They barely have enough resources to take the Battlespire, let alone keep control of it and defend it. But the bitter sibling rivalry between Moaf and Shardai has led their clans to make overzealous and poorly thought out decisions. You may have thought it was Dagon's idea to take the Spire, but the original scheme can actually be accredited to Zivlai Moaf. Here's just a few of the key blunders which we've seen so far throughout this game. The sacking and occupation of the Shade Perilous, which led already thin resources to be spread even further. The adoption of the clanless, treacherous seducers into Dagon's army. And that whole fiasco in the Chimera that was intended to be the Apprentice's end. Instead, it led them to acquiring not only Dagon's protonymic, but also the Savior's Hide, perhaps the one single artifact capable of resisting Dagon's magic. Amargo, having witnessed all this and his own counsel being ignored by Dagon, is naturally not too pleased with how his faction has been eating itself alive. So Mr. Storm here has his own plan. Phaedra Shardai, Zivali Moaf, Mayrunes Dagon, we're just gonna banish them all. Temporarily, of course. Just so Imago has enough time to restore the kingdom to its full glory, tear it all down and build it back stronger, which is entirely within Dagon's motus operandi. Each of Dagon's adoptive children all represent different aspects of destruction and change. Phaedra Shardai represents impulsivity, Zivilai Moaf represents ambition, Imago, on the other hand, represents revolution. You know, that thing those mythic dawn goons won't stop raving about. Imago has managed to uncover the proto slash neonymics for his destructive brethren, as well as Dagon himself, which he entrusts onto us to use as we see fit. Dagon's inventory neonymic is Jekeleho Debe Ephehezebe. Zivilai's neonymic, Wegarosa Chekohu. Phaedra's neonymic, Nepekwe Kodo. I will give you a document bearing the appropriate neonymic, the Dedric characters, the transliteration into Tamrelic, and a phonetic transcription to help you pronounce the phrases effectively. You know, when it comes time to speak these names, is the apprentice going to have this memorized or are they going to have to read off a flashcard? What if they fuck up the pronunciation? Does it ruin the whole incantation? God forbid Mr. Fister has a lisp or some other kind of speech impediment or we're all doomed. Imago hands the apprentice one of the free gate keys needed to open up the portal to get to Dagon's hunting lodge. In case you've forgotten at this point, our battle buddy had been captured by the prince back in the Shade Perilous and taken away to his hunting lodge. The other two keys are carried by, you guessed it, the devilish duo. You can either threaten to use their nimics to banish them and they'll give you the key, or you can just straight up send their asses to the void and they'll drop the key, which I think is the canon way to go about this business, given Amargo's plans. While venturing into the wing of Zivilai Moaf, one can find a side passage leading into an observatory. Here you'll find a rather out of place looking Ultima, Saran Angada. He's not a Daedra or a fiend in disguise, he's actually a mortal sorcerer in cahoots with Jaegar Farn, you know, that guy who's currently impersonating the Emperor. Saran is the one responsible for the initial invasion of the Battlespire. By disguising himself as the Emperor's liaison, he managed to slip past the battle mages and bribe one of them into opening the portal. None other than Pax Debator, that wraith we banished back in the Solkarn. As for Saran on Garda, his fate was sealed as soon as he locked eyes with Mr. Fister, who pummeled his namesake into the treacherous Altma's skull, not out of vengeance, but just because he's a bit of a dick. Sorry, got a bit carried away. Zivilai Moaf, the ambitious child of Mayrun's Dagon. Like the Dramora of Amargo's clan, Zivilai demands respect, and will only deal with someone if they exchange words in a civil manner. You have gotten this far against considerable opposition. Therefore, you are able to protect yourself. You are talking to us. Therefore, you have something to sell. We will hear your plea, simple and direct. Then we will consider your appeal or call your bluff. So of course we have to politely blackmail the Daedric Warchief for his set of keys. There is dialogue in the game's code leading to his banishment, but unfortunately due to a bug or oversight it cannot ever be reached. So the only choice we have in game is blackmail. 
Next up is Phaedra Shardai, Dagon's impulsive child, who quite literally lives behind a house of mirrors and entry sigils. You might be here a while until you find the correct enemy that drops the sigil you need. When you finally reach Shardai and begin dialogue, be cautious. It's possible to get a game over here just by simping for her. You can trick her into believing that Zivilai gave you her neonymic, but she'll just get mad and end dialogue. I was afraid you wouldn't come back because I personally want to watch you torn limb from limb! Seize him! So unfortunately, there's only one other option, and you already know what that is. Once Tweedledum and Tweedledee have been dealt with, we can return to Amargo's castle, and then using all three gate keys, open up the portal into the final level of Battlespire. Thank merciful Stendar, it's almost over. But don't throw your hats off yet, no no no. We still have even more sh** to wade through before we can stamp this business as settled. We're on our way into the Deadlands to see the big man himself, the prince who I'm sure needs no further introductions by this point. Boys and girls, men and mer, are you ready to run an oblivion portal? I know I'm f***ing not. <laughs> Mayroon's hunting lodge is a hostile place, a spiteful place, a part of the game that truly feels like it hates you, not because of the oppressive atmosphere or the pools of deadly lava, no, because this entire map feels like it was handcrafted just to piss the player off. Its only saving grace is how short it is, since there's only a couple things we really need to do before we go confront Daddy Dagon and his gaff. So what does the Prince of Destruction do in his free time when he's not violently unmaking the worlds? He hunts ghosts, of course, which is actually kind of badass. Daedra Lords and Daedra Counts station themselves amidst the floating islands of the Deadlands, two different enemies which look almost identical to each other. I didn't even know there was a distinction until I looked at the wiki. The Dark Seducers also make their return as the personal bodyguards of Mayrun's Dagon. There's only about a handful, but trust me, you can't miss them. I was saving more often in this level than any other just because I kept getting knocked into the lava by rogue magicka balls. You are able to escape the infernal pool before you fry, but there's only one ramp up and it's at the very start of the level. Though I did manage to find a spot where I could jump back up thanks to Mr. Fister's high athleticism. I have no idea how they decided to ship this. The majority of this game's levels so far have been relatively inoffensive. This is the only thing in Battlespire which I found genuinely frustrating, which is saying a lot. The best strat I found for this stage was to back yourself up against the wall and let enemies come to you, so that the knockback doesn't send you flying, which basically means you'll just be standing in place shaking your mouse for minutes at a time, not really doing much. If you look down to your feet at spawn, you can find a letter from Amargo's clan with some helpful information. In order to defeat Dagon, we must wield the Sword of the Moon Reaver, a weapon formed of Dagon's own flesh and the only blade that could possibly harm him. The sword is in possession of a dark seducer, Dagon's personal bodyguard and paramour. Really man, they got you too. You'd think even ancient gods would be impervious to feminine influence, but I guess you'd be wrong. Women are just too OP. Anyway, Amargo gives us a to-do list to make sure we're prepared for the big showdown. Before we go confront Dagon, one must do the following. Gird yourself with the armor of the Savior's Hide. Arm yourself with the Sword of the Moon Reaver. Trust in the power of secret names and the aid of absent friends. Put your hope in the shock of surprise and the swiftness of desperate action. The seducer guarding the sword is not too far from where we spawn, just off on this little island. She's tough, but still no match against the bombardment of right jabs. After that, we can make our way all the way around the floating archipelago to this locked door. The password is Lemicwe, the name of one of the Daedra counts that we had to kill on the way up here. All the Daedra are required to wear name tags while at work. If you don't have the Savior's Hide anymore, for whatever reason, then you actually have a chance to get it back. There's a friendly Wraith who will just give you the armor. <laughs> He's not actually a wraith, just the figment of a kind-hearted developer making sure you don't fuck up the ending sequence. 
Not that it really matters because I don't think more than a handful of people have ever made it this far, and those who have are probably paying enough attention to have kept the armour past level 5. So you'll need to shoot this crossbow and then make your way up Mount Doom in order to reach the front door of Dagon's Lodge. To say Dagon has security would be an understatement. Dagon has a full on task force waiting outside his door. Even with an insanely broken character like Mr. Fister, I still struggled here and probably spent about 10 minutes just dealing with the goon squad outside. Technically you only need to kill one of the Daedra counts to get the sigil, but because they run around all over the place it's almost impossible to target one single enemy. The interior is filled with, you guessed it, even more enemies, but eventually we work our way round room by room, collecting sigils until being teleported to the Great Chamber, in which Lord Mayrune's Dagon stands in all his multi-armed terror. Behind him, our friend. Behind her, some weird soyjack looking face on the wall. This is it, Chief. A thousand curses! You are right, mortal. I have been a fool. Mistakes have been made, but no more. You will die now, before more mistakes are made. Before Dagon can strike, the Nocturnal Lieutenant JCL Morgan appears to give the Prince a strip tease, momentarily catching Dagon off guard, which gives the Apprentice just enough time to strike him with the Moon Reaver, sending his sorry red ass screeching into the void. That was certainly something. I sure hope Clarentavius is doing alright. After this penultimate confrontation, which is basically the DOS equivalent of a quick time event, the game actually banishes itself into oblivion. No credits, no epilogue, not even a thanks for playing. So what, is that it? Did I win? Well, since the game won't give us an epilogue, I guess I'll have to somewhat provide one here. Whatever happened to Vitasha Trinell or Josiah Cade, the two canon apprentices, is unknown. Although repairs to the Battlespire would have been possible, it was eventually decided by the Imperial Council that the reconstruction would be undesirable, as it proved too tempting of a target for the Daedric Lords like Mehrun's Dagon. Since the event, all entry gates into the Spire have been sealed, and to this day the tower is abandoned, a ruin, drifting across the slipstreams of the Aether lost to time. One Mur back on Tamriel might have some more answers, but he's not telling. A Telvani wizard, Dever Fur, seems to have a keen interest in the fall of the Battlespire. Somehow acquiring a few artifacts once possessed and used by the Apprentice, including the Curus of the Saviour's Hide, the Mace Scourge, and potentially a Crescent Blade if you can kill its guardian. The blade once held by the Dark Seducer serving under May Runes. After the fall, all the remaining Crescents were gathered and destroyed, except for this one. In game, there's no way to ask him how he managed to acquire any of this, so all we have to work with is speculation. Most likely it's just a nod left in by Bethesda for anyone who actually cared enough about Bowspire.
In the religious pantheon of the Dark Elves, four corners make up the House of Troubles. Mehrunes Dagon, Malakath, Molag Ball, and Shegarath, the Bad Daedra. In a similar way, Battlespire suffers in Fey from its own House of Troubles, though the devils dwell not in the corners, but in the very foundations. From the very beginning of character creation, you are already being deceived, though there's no way you could possibly know this without doing your research. Don't bother taking the game's own manual as gospel, as even this text exists as another way of fooling the unaware layman. In other words, the information in the manual doesn't actually reflect how stats are affected in-game. This isn't too uncommon for older games, as back then the manual actually took longer to produce than it did to print the final copies of the game, so by the time information was published in a manual, it might have been changed or patched. Battlespire is certainly no exception to this. The wikis also don't do a great job of explaining the quirks of this game's character creator, so most of my information comes from random reddit posts. The first non-choice is deciding on a racial type to base everything off. The reason this is a non-choice is because this only gives you a 5, 10 or 15 point boost in each race's primary skill set. Even Skyrim had more racial variants than this. Don't pay attention to the descriptions for each race, they are just flavour text and don't have any real gameplay effects. For example, High Elves are said to be immune to paralysis here, just like in previous games. However, no such buff is applied, and even if High Elves could resist paralysis, it would be useless anyway, since no such effect exists in-game. You'll notice that a few races are absent from the lineup, even by retro Elder Scrolls standards. The furries are nowhere to be seen in this entire game, I have no idea why. I guess the battle spire doesn't allow mages to keep pets. You will die like a rat. Orcs and Imperials weren't given the playable race treatment until Morrowind, so I'll let that slide. But it does mean that if I want to play the race closest to the Brits, I have to play as a Breton instead of an Orc. Regardless of your choice, it won't matter too much in the grand scheme of things, since most skills in this game tend to level very quickly. That extra 10 or 15 points will only be of minimal usefulness early on. And of course you get to tweak your appearance, to an extent. This is cute, I guess. The next screen you need to pay attention to very carefully. This is the mainframe for building a solid character in Battlespire. A major mistake here could cost you your playthrough later down the line. The entire class creation system is based around point allocation. Increase attributes and skills by spending points, give your character disadvantages and lower stats to gain points. Balance in all things, but as you can guess, not everything here is what you'd call balance. You get a certain amount of points to spend whenever you start the game, as well as at the beginning of each area. Every attribute you invest into also governs a set of skills which cannot be raised to a value higher than their governing attribute. So even if you don't really need a certain attribute, it might be worth raising it just so you can level its dependent skills. Initially, each stat can be raised to a maximum of 75, and then 100 further down the line. Some stats do what you would expect, the most straightforward being strength and speed. Speed's not very useful, but strength affects the damage output of all melee attacks. Intelligence affects your maximum mana points, willpower affects your ability to resist spells and absorb magicka while using spell absorption. Endurance is just an enigma. If you're a rational human being, unlike me, you would assume that endurance affects your max health. But no, max HP is only affected by your wounds. Aye, wounds. That's a thing. So what does endurance do? Well, it sure as hell doesn't boost fatigue like it says in the manual, since there's not even a fatigue bar in game. As far as I can tell, endurance only affects how well you can swim, which is about as useful as a party trick here in Battlespire. Feel free to dump endurance straight to 10, the lowest any attribute can be. Wounds though, you want that as high as the game will let you take it. Max HP will only increase by one fifth of itself per level, so don't get stuck with a character made of glass later on. Agility can also be dropped to 10 as long as you don't plan on using the missile skill, which is actually quite good. Stealth is broken in this game, and agility has basically no effect on hit chance. 
Luck is effectively useless. Drop that sucker all the way down to 10. You should have accumulated a large sum of points at this stage, which you can instead stack into your preferred attributes and skills. Personality is a weird one because it would be a dump stat if not for the sole fact that restoration can't be leveled past your personality. So you'll actually want to keep personality living rent free on your stat sheet, unless you plan on using exploits. And let's be honest, the way this game is designed already forces you to exploit certain elements to even have a fighting chance. Skills work pretty much identically as to how they did in Daggerfall. The higher proficiency you have in a skill, the better chance you have of landing a hit or whatever. You can improve skills via use, but they can't be raised past their accompanying attribute. You've got combat skills. Big swords, short swords, pointy sticks. Weirdly, spears are in the long blade category. I mean, they are long. You've also got the missile skill, which encompasses bows and crossbows, but also javelins, which are not throwing weapons, but function as spears that you can use in melee. Yes, there are spears and there are javelins, and they are each governed by a separate skill. Once again, who signed off on this? Take me to the son of a bitch so I can tell him how much of a plonker he is. You take me to him! Take me to the son of a bitch! Take me to him! Come on! Anyway, Missile is actually a very good choice because it levels the fastest out of any skill, meaning earlier access to higher damage outputs and hit chance. Finally, there's Hand to Hand, the best weapon category, because it's the only one that can't break or be knocked to the ground. Well, technically they can, but Battlespire has no such dismemberment mechanics. Hand to hand is also pretty quick to level up, and at max proficiency will deal about as much damage as a Daedric Longsword. There's really not any downsides other than being a little weak during level 1, but that first phase won't last very long. Fists are just all around OP. The magic skills here are honestly just insulting for a game where you canonically play as a mage. Really, the only two useful skills are Destruction and Restoration. Destruction is only good at high levels, but Restoration is essentially going to be your lifeline throughout your entire playthrough. If you decide not to use Restoration, just know that healing is otherwise very rare to come by. You have access to all other skills you would expect, Mysticism, Alteration, Formaturgy, Illusion but none of them really have any spells that stand out. In fact, it's not even worth breaking down each skull spell by spell like I originally intended, because that would just be boring. You know, keep it simple stupid, chief. Just spam fireballs and stim packs, you'll be alright. Don't even get me started on what they did to the illusion school. There is one spell for the entire skill category, and guess what? It doesn't even work. Invisibility is broken and doesn't work because stealth is broken and doesn't work. I really can't help but to ask, why? <laughs> the spell effects are just kind of all over the place as well. There's no consistent logic as to which spell belongs in what school. One weird choice is why they decided to put poison in the restoration school. <laughs> hey, at least creature summoning made the cut. Though you can't use it in certain areas. Or in multiplayer. The remaining skills include miscellaneous talents like swimming, running, critical strike, and backstabbing. Things that you could honestly take or leave. Chances are your skill lineup will just be full of skills that you never have use for, and that's fine because you only really need restoration and a couple of combat skills anyway. The advantage-disadvantage system is a neutered version of Daggerfalls. You can't do anything cool like be a vampire or a holy knight, but there are some powers here that you are definitely going to need. Spell absorption is a must-have. With this power, sometimes a spell can be absorbed and converted into magic points, which can in turn be converted into health via restoration. A happy fister is a healthy fister. Hand-to-hand -hand restoration and spell absorption is essentially the bread and butter for finding the meta build in this game. Sure, the other playstyles can be fun for a few levels, but soon you'll realise that virtually every class plays the same anyway. Rapid healing and regenerate health might seem like the exact same thing, but don't be fooled. Rapid healing increases all HP that you gain from spells or potions, making it quite useful to have. Regenerate health is a flat regenerating value that does not scale with your max HP. Same deal with regenerating spell points. Neither provide a very noticeable bonus, so take it or leave it.
Athleticism is fun to have, but just be aware that it can make certain jumping puzzles harder, since you'll be able to run faster and jump further, which sounds like a good thing, but you have to remember this is the X engine we're dealing with. The only other useful thing to have is increased majory, which will increase your maximum mana points by however much times your intelligence. So naturally you want the free times bonus, even if you're playing as a barbarian. In case you haven't got the memo yet, magic is essential to have for healing alone. The disadvantages are just laughable. First off, take every critical weakness. It sounds like a bad thing, but it's really not that big a deal. Take the points you earn and put them into wounds, skills, and attributes. Disallowing certain weapon and armor types can also net you some pretty good point bonuses. This will still allow you to equip quest items, so don't worry about softlocking your game. The final step of creating your character is choosing your starting gear. Now you can just choose to spawn naked, but gear can help make a bit of a difference. If you're not using a hand-to-hand, -hand, bring a weapon that you're proficient in, otherwise it might be a while before you find something you can actually use. You'll also want a cure health spell. Teleportation is nice to have too. The spells in this menu are all the spells present in the game. Most spells are either pretty much useless or require a high proficiency to be useful, such as cause damage, which is arguably better than just using hand-to-hand -hand since it can damage multiple enemies at a time. You can also bring potions with you, but I never really bother to do that because why would you need them? This game's a joke when you know what you're doing. Keep in mind your leftover points from character creation will carry over to the start of level 2, which isn't the case for any of the other levels. Since attributes can initially only be raised to a maximum of 75, this means that you can save some points to raise your favourite attribute all the way to 100 by level 2. Quite broken, would recommend. Regardless of whatever build you decide to use, as long as you have high HP and make use of restoration magic, you can't really go wrong. Just don't try and play a pure mage, you won't have fun, that is a fact. Oh, and there's also a bug where sometimes any points left over from initial character creation will be added to the point total of every level up. So if you save 5,000 points at the start of the game, you'll get an extra 5,000 for every single level, which is just so broken that by level 3 or 4 you don't really have anything else to buy. I'm not sure what triggers this, but it did happen to a few of my characters. So how does this game actually play? Combat is clearly the primary focus of Battlespire, so what is it like? Well, for one, they went with the interesting choice of having multiple attack directions. Similar to Morrowind, but here I don't actually think it has any impact on the damage output. You swing your weapon by holding right click and flicking your mouse, which is a feature, I guess. Does it work? Surprisingly, yes. Does it add anything? Not really. Is it tearing the paint off my desk? I think so. Is it too late to buy a mousepad? Every piece of equipment you use has a death timer ticking from the moment you equip it. When durability reaches 0%, the given item breaks and you are forced to make use of another. Because most equipment is randomly generated, even unique quest items, this means you might struggle to find weapons you can even use if yours breaks. It is what it is, I guess, but just another reason to convert to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. A Coffer of Restoration can be used to restore one single item, but these are a rare sight and an unreliable method of managing durability. I do like the idea of making use of whatever you can find, it's kind of like a survival or immersive sim mechanic in that way. But here with weapon proficiencies and forbidden equipment types, the idea falls flat, if that even was the idea to begin with. Another aspect of loot in the randomly generated variety is enchantment effects. There are a vast number of possible effects. Enchantments can act as skill increases, or they can also give the player access to spells, abilities, or apply damaging effects to weapons or munitions. That's if you can even figure out what each enchantment even does. There's no way to tell what effect any given enchantment will have unless you either find a text in-game to translate it or look it up online, which is mainly the reason I didn't pay attention to whatever enchanted item I was wearing. All these goodies and power-ups and I never really bothered to use them. You can argue this is just a case of me being lazy, but I would argue that this info would be better off in the UI somewhere, not scribbled on some random scroll in the corner of the map. The trademarked Bethesda spell creator has been adapted to work here in a novel little way. The spellbook is like a diet spell creator, but this time you can use it on the fly. 
You can select the spell effects you want to cast from the list and then change its properties with these three buttons. You can even hotkey spells to a function key which is rather convenient. The same can't be said for how these tools are presented to the player, which will take a little know-how to be able to start customising spells for effect. Let's unpack this shall we? The first function of the spellmaker changes the icon. That's all it does. So only the last two buttons really do anything. The second is for deciding your target. Either yourself, a single target, a radius on target, or an AoE centered on the caster. The second function dictates the element of the spell. This only comes into play if the spell has any elemental properties, but it's still available to all spells. It just won't do anything. The effects are Magicka, Fire, Frost, Shock, or Poison. There's no monetary cost to editing spells, there's no money in this game. Instead, Magicka to cast is determined by skill proficiency. It's kind of liberating in a way that past and future iterations lack, being able to try out any spell with different targeting configurations on the fly, but ultimately it just feels like a stand-in feature that wasn't developed past the point of its primary utility. The best thing I can say about the system is that it works, and it does what I need it to, though in practice I only used it a handful of times and then set my spells to a hotkey. I will briefly touch on stealth, but as hinted at earlier, I could not get stealth to work. Even with high stats and invisibility, enemies would just instantly spot me as soon as I poked around the corner. Even if the mechanics of stealth worked, I still can't see them being viable just because of the overall encounter and level design. There are no alternate paths to objectives, no vantage points or stealthy passages. There is one route and you can guarantee anything important will be guarded by swarms of Daedra. And that's pretty much all there is to say about the main systems that govern Battlespire's core gameplay. There is the dialogue feature also, but really that serves more as a tool for storytelling and dumping information onto the player. Well, I suppose there is one other feature of Battlespire that I haven't really talked about very much. I don't know how to start the game though. Twenty five or so. Uh, I guess press, press, just press done. Yeah, we just both oh, okay. uh, needed to press. Oh press shit! Ready. Oh my god, it's you! You're not naked though. So, Watch so, out, there's so a scam. <laughs> Playing through the multiplayer component of Battlespire was an absolute treat, because it gave me the opportunity to share this schizophrenic mess of a dungeon crawler with another unfortunate soul. I was also genuinely shocked that I managed to get the Moi player to even work. I've had more trouble setting up Skyrim together in Tez 3 MP than I have this game's ancient decaying multiplayer game mode. Easily the most excruciating challenge of trying to set up a multiplayer match is finding someone to play with, either willingly or unwillingly. In my case I had help from my friend Berg, who was happy to be subjected to such torments. So, so my, my character looks like um, like a Vampire Bloodlines NPC. And yours looks like, um, he kind of looks like a young version of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I mean, I can I can see a bit of a resemblance here. Oh, wow. I mean, <laughs> it's the same <laughs> so, so I'm still white, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I see, I, I see, I see how it is. The next hurdle is actually setting up an online game with your victim or victims. I was expecting this to be a huge pain in the ass, but thanks to how the GOG version is set up, the process is really quite simple. You only need to connect to one another using a client like Hamachi, and then launch the run multiplayer application from your start menu shortcuts. Then either play as host or join a game using the host's IP. It's really that easy and I commend whoever put the GOG edition of this game together for not making this needlessly complicated. Because the alternatives, let's just say they take a bit more know-how and I do not know how. Character creation works pretty much the same as in single player, only difference being you can choose to have more or less points to spend on your character. You can even use classes imported from single player, which includes leveled versions of each class. Playing as these is the only way to get stats above the maximum threshold as even in the higher levels, multiplayer CC won't let you go above 75 in any given skill. There are three game modes, deathmatch and team deathmatch we didn't really touch in any proper sense, at least not how they're meant to be played. Cooperative is essentially just the main game, but you can play through it with up to seven other unfortunate souls, plus yourself. Interestingly, you can choose to play all modes, even co-op, without any enemy spawns. 
All key items, notes and sigils will be dropped amidst dozens and dozens of sacks, which dot the hallways where Daedra once stood. Whether it's possible to complete every stage with no enemies present, I'm not sure. Though Berg and I were able to somehow sequence break the Weir Gate because more gears spawned than what should have. Wait, we're not meant to have- wait, there's some duplication going on here because we're not meant to have this many gears early on. Um... I've, we've got all of them. We've got all five, but there's meant to be like um, like a boss battle with some Dermora guy. I mean, if, if we- it, like, that's the boss battle for anything aside from another gear. If not, then fuck it, we sequence break. If <laughs> yeah, the game let's sequence break this shit. Ball, <laughs> let's speedrun this. I'm not sure why or how this happened, but it happened. Providing you have the game running as a host, you can even load into levels alone with no monsters, if you so choose. Which is good if you want to collect footage or just admire the scenery. Just be prepared to see some very broken skyboxes. There are some things that you can't do in a multiplayer lobby for one reason or another. Talking to enemies, you can't do that. Entering the boats or airship, nope. Even all the non-hostile NPCs used for dialogue do not appear in an online game. It's starting to make sense now why a lot of information is presented in note form in addition to dialogue. You also can't save or load, but that should be given. For some reason, certain interior cells are handled on a per-client basis. So if you and a buddy go into the same house, you'll actually be in two different houses, but when you exit, you'll sync back up into the same world space. Kind of like instances in an MMO. Was this supposed to be like a potion shop? It's like a really blue looking house. Yeah, it's very blue on the inside. <laughs> it's got wait, blue wait. ambience. You're not in here for me though. Yeah, it's same. It's okay. It, it, it desynchronizes. I think it like. Uh, what if you come back outside? Uh, well, let me see if I can talk to the. Yeah, not talking to locals. I forgot. If I can oh, okay. Out, uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it keeps track of us in the, like, overworld, but in the building interiors we are placed into separate realities, it seems like. The interiors in these cells are like their own little danger realms, basically. Yeah, each, each house is a... It's each like house a is a, its own pocket dimension. Yes, and the doors are like just two-way portals, but... Hmm. What are the lore implications of this? <laughs> Don't even fucking stop. <laughs> The only useful function I could find that is exclusive to co-op is the ability to use spells on one another, but even then it seems limited to only touch spells, which I could never get to work on enemies, but here on friendlies they at least seem to work sometimes. So I guess that you could play the role of heal slot if you really wanted to. Even with a large group I can't see any benefits to having designated party roles since every character has the potential to be a self-sustaining tank and damage dealer all in one. As a whole, the multiplayer actually seemed to work fine, at least on my side as the host. The game feels exactly the same, including all the familiar bugs and quirks from single player. None more annoying and persistent than getting stuck on random pieces of geometry, something that in my many hours of playing Battlespire had trained myself to avoid. Berg on the other hand, he was still learning. It's usually... I got stuck for whatever reason. Oh no. Where I landed. Oh, I cannot no. move, I cannot move. Can you just, just punch me to, to knock me back? Usually when this happens in single player, you're fucked. This does happen sometimes. Uh, just, just <laughs> kill me then, I suppose. I imagine multiplayer must have been a big selling point for this game, so at the very least I can say it does actually work as intended, which is a first for Bethesda multiplayers. I don't think any additional enemies spawn though, so playing co-op would actually make the game even easier if you were all playing to the meta. But hey, punching through waves of snarling demonic minions is always more fun with a friend, right? Still, the exclusion of certain mechanics is a little disappointing, and I wish it was worth playing as any other class so you could fill out that party-based dungeon crawler experience with your buddies. If you can't convince anyone to spend cash on the game, there's always other options available, ones that are very easily accessible with a quick search engine query. Just make sure you're all playing the GOG 1.5 edition that includes all the multiplayer shortcuts. If you decide to use any other version of the game, then best of luck to you. Thanks to Berg as well for letting me torture him for a couple hours. He's actually working on a retrospective for a game called Arcanum, which looks like an absolute trip. I'll leave his socials in the description. I implore you to give them a click.
If the goal for Battlespire was to create a more enjoyable dungeon experience compared to Daggerfall, then I can say that they at least succeeded on an artistic and narrative level. The attention to detail and variety on display in each level is really quite impressive for its age. Not to mention the visuals, which are easily the most memorable part of the whole experience. I'd go as far to count the art style and tone as some of my favourite in the series. It's this blend of fantasy and sci-fi elements that really help sell the idea that we are travelling through these outer realms. So what we see here should be alien compared to the architecture on Tamriel. The 2D enemy sprites are also crafted with care to blend seamlessly within the art style, and on top of that, each enemy is recognisable from their silhouette alone, with the exception of the Daedra Lords and Counts, but they can't all be winners. The models for the weapons and armour pieces I find to be less inspired. It does create a clash of styles when you have this medieval equipment strewn about all over these alien looking hallways, but it's the kind of clash that I'm fond of because it adds to the game's character of being a pulpy retro dungeon crawler. Some of the more disappointing moments in the newer entries come from visual design that is just quite honestly lacking in creativity. I mean, the visuals across Oblivion might as well be from a cheap Lord of the Rings knockoff, and Skyrim took the strange, almost spaceship-like design in the Duema Ruins and turned them into just about any Dwarven-style ruin you've ever seen in fantasy media. It's nice then, here in Battlespire, to see the artists go a little crazy, making the most of what technology they had to create environments that still look great almost three decades in the future. Some of them anyway. The Chimera is let down by the game's technology, and the Hunting Lodge is pretty much just another hell world, hence the Oblivion Portal comparison. But you might as well be assaulting Bowser's castle. The soundtrack also slaps. This is definitely some high quality tonal architecture. The audio theme of each level complements the visuals in a way that adds heaps to the already oppressive gloomy atmosphere. The tracks aren't these intricately composed scores with soaring melodies and chirpy little midi tones, they are ambient soundscapes of decay, fear, and isolation. One of my biggest personal grievances with Battlespire is the final stage, the Hunting Lodge. I can forgive the spell knockback, the pools of lava, and the awful level design, but what I cannot forgive is a bug that causes the music to be absent during gameplay, because the theme for the Hunting Lodge is one of the best amongst the entire library of Elder Scrolls OSTs. Other tracks like the Chimera of Desolation and the Weirgate make you feel like you're drifting across the surface of some bereft Martian wasteland. Oat, A.M. Hekim, and Ute sounds a bit silly with its organs and choirs, but it does work with the idea that the Soul Khan is this unholy chapel of communion for the undead. Every single track is a banger, and to my knowledge this is the only Elder Scrolls OST to feature synthesized elements so prominently. The composer behind Battlespire's soundtrack to this day is completely unconfirmed, and no official CD was ever released. As for the story, what's in the game is alright. It is the most basic kind of story, there's a big bad doing big and evil stuff, and you, as the anointed hero of the day, must put an end to the big bad and save your friend. You know, all the stuff we're used to from these games. Bethesda has never really been very skillful with their main plot lines, but what they are damn good at is drizzling those simple plots with a hefty serving of lore and speculation. Battlespire relies on its portrayal of the Daedra not as mindless servants of their lords, but as mercenaries. The problem is that there isn't enough of this characterization to make it a consistent theme throughout the game. You just get sprinkles of it before it's off to go punch more mean-looking dudes in the face. To really flesh out the factions of the Oblivion Realms would only have taken a minor rewrite of the plot. You could have the big bad be the final encounter, but why not sprinkle some minor groups in along the way? You're telling me that one guy with some dorky armour, a certain blade, and a high score at Scrabble is all it takes to defeat the Daedric Prince of Destruction. Maybe instead of just blasting through each stage to get to the exit, going out of your way to aid whatever clan or entity resides there could have a substantial effect on the final boss fight. The seed for this idea is already planted with the JC or Morgan subplot, but that is literally integrated into the game regardless of what you do. She still shows up at the end if you never even talk to her. The dialogue mechanic is a good idea, but it's underutilized and only a handful of characters have anything important to say. I feel like they should have doubled down on this system and let the player talk themselves through the entire game provided they were paying attention and selecting the right dialogue paths. 
If stealth and illusion magic actually worked, you could even let the player do a pacifist run of the game, which defeats the point of Battlespire being a dungeon crawler, but come on, that would have been cool. As is, the most useful thing you can do through dialogue is just make an enemy run around for a few seconds. Maybe my ideas suck and I'm wrong, or maybe instead of theorising about what could have been, we should bring our focus back to what is there, what did make it into the game. Despite how evident the flaws are with even just a few minutes of starting a new game, the mechanics of character creation still made the cut, and this is a choice that honestly baffles me. The fact that half the attributes do nothing on their own, but are essential to level up some skills is such a clown lord possibility, I have to question if it's a bug or part of the intended character progression. Because if it's not a bug, I have to imagine this. Someone, at some point, with a spreadsheet laid out in front of them, saw that endurance has no effect on stats except for how long you can hold your breath underwater, and thought to themselves, yeah, well obviously that's what endurance is meant to do. Why would it affect your character's hardiness? That's what wounds is for. Fucking wounds. I'll give you a fucking wound. In Daggerfall, your attributes have a much more substantial effect on your character's actions and abilities, and it is balanced in such a way that nearly every playstyle is a valid choice. In Battlespire, even playing as two of the most basic corners of the RPG triangle is near impossible. You can't be a stealthy character because sneaking doesn't work, and you can't play as a pure mage because magic is too weak and magicka is scarce. It's possible, in theory, to play classes like an archer or a sorcerer, but without balance, playing in such a way proves a huge challenge for no real reward. If you want to be effective, you have to use healing magic. You have to pick spell absorption at the start of the game. You have to start with max wounds. Fucking wounds. It doesn't even make sense. Surely if you have more wounds, that is a bad thing, right? Like, like, ugh. Your ability to even progress through the game is gated by how much you know about the systems beforehand. Sure, in Daggerfall, the player is also prone to making decisions in character creation that will lead to a bad build, but at least in that game, the stats are rooted in both common sense and rules defined by the genre. If they were struggling this hard to create balanced player progression, why didn't they just reuse Daggerfall's stat equations? Were they worried about plagiarizing themselves? All this begs the question. Did they even playtest? From what I've seen, sure they did. If everyone who playtested decided to run around naked and use hand-to-hand -hand and restoration magic, because honestly, it's just not worth playing any other way. To my knowledge, there's never been a fan-made project to bring Battlespire into a more playable and convenient engine. Unlike with Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, and even Redguard. I know only two of those are actually released to the public, but still. I've seen suggestions to somehow mod the levels and mechanics of Battlespire into Daggerfall Unity, but I don't know if that's possible or how well it would work. Though it would be nice to one day see some kind of ported version of Battlespire that addresses a lot of the engine quirks and bugs, as well as allowing mod support to fix the aforementioned numerical abominations going on in the stat systems. In conclusion, Battlespire is a game that I admire for its artistic merits alone. Its atmosphere is truly memorable, even if what you do between each level is bland and forgettable. Is the game good? Hell no. Does having pretty art and a banging soundtrack make up for that lack of quality? Hell no. It's messy, it's horny, it's downright near unplayable at times, but much like Redguard, I've come to grow fond of its charm. Even if it is just an expansion pack torn from a much better game and mutilated into its own twisted mechanical nightmare. Oh Battlespire, as my last light flickers and I gaze through your luminous entrails, I see cotton tombstones, broken blades, upturned bookshelves whose spines hang alongside their scholars, a grim tapestry. I hear the juvenile howls of distant creatures, the merry roars of your invaders, and the crackling of fire and frost, an orchestra of terror. You call me your apprentice, your student but you've been a most cruel and unwise teacher, and as I absorb myself deeper and deeper into your emerald abyss, I can't help but to ask, what exactly was the lesson again?
Thank you for listening slash watching me ramble about this 26 year old mess for a couple hours. I try to make the audio at least not suck too hard, but I don't exactly have the best setup here. Anyhow, I make do. My thanks goes out to all the usual suspects as well, the various wikis, everyone at Bethesda who worked on this game, as well as everyone online who took the time to write about it. Every scrap of knowledge I could gather on this thing helped out in some way. I will at some point be taking a look at the Elder Scrolls Travels games, even if I just cover them all in one go, but I'd also like to work on other retrospective type videos that aren't Elder Scrolls related. We'll wait and see on those, no promises. It takes many gruelling hours to research, pore over scripts, record voiceover, and edit footage to eventually make up these longer reviews. So if you've made it in this far and want to show your appreciation, then the best thing you can do is share the video. Last time I made a donation link, but no one donated. So this time I'm only asking that you pay me in clout. Maybe one day I'll make a Patreon and I'll offer some kind of early access. We'll see how things go. Finally, I'd like to announce the all-new official Discord server, because the last one was honestly a cesspool. I personally find it therapeutic to sift through garbage sometimes, but I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so I'm committed to making this newer server at least somewhat usable outside of pure shitposting purposes. If you just want to contact me for whatever reason, that's also the best place to do so. But that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for coming. I'll see you all again in another six months when I finish my 10 hour review of the Oblivion PSP port. Oh, and since Starfield is out and everyone's supposed to have an opinion on that game, here's mine. I long for the great release that death will bring. Death will be the ultimate escape from all my problems. Death cannot come soon enough. I am looking forward to death. No more worrying about the inland revenue. No more worrying about paying the gas bill. No more worrying about paying the electricity bill. No more worrying about paying the council tax. Goodbye, cool world!